Okay, so I've started recording. So morning, everybody. Um, today, because of the popular demand on the group, I'm going to talk about my story. Um, so my story, my daughter now is 19. So this goes back to, so we figured out, my husband and I, we figured out that our child had some problem with, uh, some problem. We just didn't know what it was. I think by the time when she was about five. So this, my math is bad. So we are looking back at about 14 years ago, right? So at the outset, I want to tell you 14 years ago, there wasn't much help, nothing available in terms of uh, dyslexia help that is available now. Awareness was virtually non-existent. I didn't know anything. Now, just because I didn't know doesn't mean there is no awareness, but we just, I didn't know anything and none in my family were aware of it. And also, see, we come from, uh, my husband and I, we come from regular upper middle class family. So, you know, it's not as if we have tons of wealth behind us to take care of this. So we had to also work. Uh, and at that time, since there wasn't enough uh, uh, enough in terms of uh, other support, right? Other support like you have, you have now. One of us had to give up our career. So I'm, I'm not saying it is mandated. It is not because if you both couples need to work, it is very, it is expensive. You know, therapies are expensive and both have to uh, contribute to the family finances. It's very difficult. But at that time, under the circumstances, oh man, many people are coming. You think I should wait? So uh, under the circumstances, one of us had to give up. So it was done well. It was not done out of any bitterness or, oh, I gave it up. See, I want to make this, why am I saying all this? I want to tell you because it was done out of a concern for the child and to help our child. So that bitterness of giving up is not there. And luckily or fortunately for us, we never thought, why me? Even that didn't happen. You know, that, uh, oh my God, why my child is behaving like this? Why, what is happening to me? That sort of thing also didn't happen. So I'm just giving you this setting, uh, setting, and then I'll go on with my, with how it happened. So, uh, one of us gave it up, which was me, and my husband travels a lot. So his was a marketing job. So it was very difficult. We were a young family. And um, at that time, my older daughter who was diagnosed, who was assessed for dyslexia, which we didn't know about, at that time was five. And my younger daughter at that time, I think she was one. So we, it was a very young family and husband who travels a lot. But uh, it was important that one of us travel, one of us earns, and the other person did a lot of, did took care of the uh, needs of the child. So this is the background. And I'm not saying it was easy. It was very difficult. It was very hard. The road was very, very tough because it drained us both physically and emotionally as a couple. But fortunately, what we did was first fortunately was the acceptance because we never questioned why me, both of us, both my husband and I, we never thought why me. It never even occurred to us. I don't know. I think we are made that way. It never occurred to us. But we had a family, both my in-laws and my parents, who were very accepting of the situation and they gave us the moral and emotional support because we were very open about it. So the moral and the emotional support as a couple. Uh, as a daughter, I needed from my parents, as a son, he needed from his. And as both daughter-in-law and son-in-law, from both sets of the in-laws, we got, which, which was unquestioned. It was unconditional and not at all questioned. And for that, both of us are deeply grateful. So this is the background. Like I said, at the, at the outset, I want to tell all parents, it is hard work, very, very hard work. Uh, it requires an enormous amount of time and sacrifice on the part of the parents, given the 
educational setup in our country and uh, because everything much of it we have to do 90 percent of it we have to do so it is hard work but it can be done you just have to give yourself about 10 to 12 years and it can be done and once it is done the return on your investment is wonderful because I, my husband and I and our extended families are now enjoying the fruit of our labor. Our daughter has blossomed and she is, there's still work to be done. It is not, uh, it, what I'm saying now sounds very, uh, very hunky-dory and glamorous. It is not. Still work needs to be done, but it is more now on her part. It is the daughter's effort more than ours now. It has come to that stage. So this is the background. This is how, uh, uh, this is where we started from. So let me begin right at the beginning. So mine was, uh, uh, I was working, both of us were working. I had a normal delivery and uh, everything was normal. There was no birth complication. Delivery was very easy. It was like an about, I think it was about 20 minutes to half an hour. I had no problem. All the parameters, you know, first cry, opening eyes, everything she met. So we didn't have a problem. So uh, what happened was I put her in a, fortunately, or on, I think it's fortunately, I didn't know, I didn't do any research. So I decided that I will put my child in a, uh, in a Montessori school or a school, not Montessori, I didn't know at Montessori at that time, in a school that is not going to, uh, put any pressure on my child when it comes to writing. That was my criteria. Don't ask me why, because at that time I was, uh, most of my friends' children were going to school and they were writing. And I realized, because when I went to school, I didn't do any writing. I, I went to, in, when we were in Nanganalur, Meenambakam in those days, I went to a school that hardly gave any writing. I did L, kindergarten there, LKG and UKG there. And then when I, came to school here, I studied in Vidyodhya. When I was studying, we didn't have any homework, no tests, nothing till class five. So I was looking for a school which would not trouble my child to write. So I started knocking doors. And uh, finally, I found a small Montessori school when I asked them when will, because most schools had said, don't worry, your child will start writing by three, three and a half. But this small Montessori school, the Sharanalaya Montessori in uh, Kamdar Nagar in Mahalingapuram. When I asked them, they said, we'll, we'll, the child will write when she's ready to write. And that was the perfect answer for me. So I put her in that school. And I think she was about three and a half at that time. So it was, life was going on. But there was one thing that was always niggling me. At the back of my mind, there was always because this child would, uh, see where she I didn't realize it was all in retrospect but she was very active in my womb uh, but then when you are a when you are pregnant with your first child you have no idea right so she was hyperactive in my womb itself I believe that is also a sign now I didn't know and in my ex my parents and in-laws nobody knew I mean it didn't even occur to me to share this because you think that is normal right so uh, she was very, very active uh, in the womb. And as a child, she missed her milestones. I didn't know this was significant either. She, she spoke very early. By about eight to nine months, she was saying, Amma and, you know, Tata and, uh, you know, Nana, Appa, that sort of thing. She was saying by the time she was eight months, which is very early. And she was exposed to three languages because I'm, I speak Telugu, my husband speaks Tamil, and there is English. So she was exposed to all three languages and she was just, she could speak in one sentence, all three languages. And what would happen when she was speaking to my parents, it would be in Telugu, my in-laws, it would be in Tamil. And uh, it, was, it was amazing how she was shifting between languages very very quickly so I it, that didn't bother us at all and then uh, what had happened uh, see she was she fell on her uh, stomach and after that she didn't she didn't do 
you know, children have to go on their elbows and crawl. She did that a little bit. And after that, she didn't crawl on her knees and hands, you know, knees and hands, children crawl. She missed that. She didn't do that. And now, see, I didn't keep, I didn't realize it because my mother kept telling me why she's not crawling, but she sat straight away. She, she sat because, uh, you know, parents, they are, they know because they have raised, they, they, they grew up in joint families. So they have seen children. They know what they do. So my mom was telling me, Amma was like, why she's not crawling, but she's sad. Then both of us thought maybe, oh, this is a phenomenal child. Like, um, you know, you have, uh, you know, what, what is that promotion called? You know, you skip one class, double promotion. Yeah. So instead of like a double promotion, this child has just jumped that stage and she's straight away sitting. And then she sat and then she started you know, she went on her knees and she would wobble like a penguin on her knees. And by about 11 months, all this happened within 11 months, 11 months, she started holding on to stuff and walking. Now, when she started walking, we realized that she wasn't able to walk. So she's running because again, we didn't realize it's because she's not able to balance the body and she is only running instead of walking. Because if, her, if she had uh, met all her milestones, then her muscles would have been stronger, then she would have walked. Because walking requires a lot, of, um, a, a lot of help from the body because you're walking against the gravitation, so gravitation of the earth. So you need to uh, think of the space around you and see that your body walks while it is aware of this. Because the brain subconsciously is aware of the space around itself. So all that had to happen, right? Now, again, all this knowledge and revelation is in retrospect. At that point in time, we didn't know. So, so instead of walking, she started running. And running was a way of keeping her balance. And then she would fall. She just kept falling. And luckily, fortunately for her, what happened was instead of falling when she fell, she fell on her back, but she would put her head up. So there were, there were no head injuries, but the constant fall was there. And, and again, we didn't know what it was. We thought it was a clumsy child. She will just pick it up and go along the way. So this was one of the, one of the things that we, been, we were noticing. The other thing that happened was she had a very poor appetite. So even when she would drink milk, say at that age, she had to drink 50 ml of milk. She would drink 25 and be 25 ml of milk and be satiated. And she will just lose interest in it. And we'll be like, why is she not drinking? So then what we did to supplement the nutrition, again, without realizing, we would give her a multigrain, you know, that homemade <coughs> satmava. We would put all multigrain. So without realizing, we gave her non-gluten food to take care of the hyperactive. We didn't know this. And this was at a time when um, dietary restrictions were not aware of for hyperactivity at all. We just didn't know. So out of our own traditional, following traditional food systems, we just gave her, uh, we just gave her uh, uh, this Sattamaukul, which was homemade using multi, multi grains. So even 25 ml when she drank, so it would give her energy. So that sort of thing we did. And we gave her those traditional baths, which until two years, so you give the oil massage and as an infant, you'll give the child a hot water bath. So this traditional uh, bath, um, I learned from my mother. So after, once the child was three months old, I started giving those baths myself. Again, without realizing that all these got incorporated as initial massages and occupational therapy for the child. I didn't know. Neither did any of the adults in my family, but it became very helpful. So the oil massage and all that we did. And then what happened, I put her in this Montessori school. It was all right. It, she was four and a half. And see, this child was like, was, was hyperactive. We didn't know again it was hyperactivity. So she would just keep constantly running around in the house. So it's like, imagine roller skates with motors on them very active and see she was an undemanding child in the sense very self-contained 
only problem was we had to keep an eye, eye on her because she would just climb the stairs and I have pretty steep stairs in the house. So the, our way of keeping track of where she is is to put thick, not thin, those thick anklets on her so that there is a sound where she, wherever she goes. Because by the time you see she's gone upstairs, she's running around. So we would put anklets on her. So when she was like one and a half, two years, we'll know what she's going, what she's doing. And she wouldn't sleep. It was exhausting for us. And I was working at that time. So my mother would have, so we had people, baby care help and my mom and my mother-in-law. So all these people are taking turns helping. And then in the nights, my husband and I would, we were just exhausted. So what we would do is we would sleep on the mattress on the floor, put the two mattresses against the windows, lock the door of the bedroom. So this child is running around, climbing windows. We thought if she falls, she'll fall on us on the mattress. And she would sleep at her own time at two o'clock. Now, just because she slept at 2, 2.30 doesn't mean she'll sleep till 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock. She's up by 6.37. I mean, it was exhausting for us. She was fine. And uh, we didn't know what it was. So we thought she was like that. And it, it, uh, there were times when I would get irritated because I am back from work by about 5, 5.30 and then you have to take, all, take over the chores after that, right? You have to help with the fixing dinner. And, and I need to give my mother respite or my mother-in-law respite. So it just became an extension of everything and when, uh, of work. So it was work, work and more work. And when my husband would come over the weekends, then he would take over. So it was no, he would come back from his, from his travel on work. And then it became work, work, and more work. And we, the thing was, we didn't realize it was more, more work. We just did it. So the child now, she went to the Montessori school. And in Montessori, they give you time to do your own thing. So I think by the time she was four and a half, uh, they started doing, she knew how to grip the pencil. But then they started doing standing lines and sleeping lines and then the slanting lines, right? And in all this, uh, what, has, what, has, what was happening was the, the running around, the hyperactivity was continuing. And she was a very strong child. See, this child wouldn't, see, she wouldn't fall ill. But if she fell ill, we were terrified because her, when she, especially children are prone to, uh, they're prone to, uh, viral infections. So when, when viral infections happen, there is a spike in the fever. And when it spikes for her, it would just spike to 103, 104.1. And then she'll get delirious at that stage. And that was when we would, we would really get up because there's no sleep. We are just keeping track of every four hours what to do. And there were two episodes of febrile seizures that she had because of the high temperature. It was only febrile, it was not epileptic. She's not on medication or anything, but there were two seizures because she's so hyper. And uh, despite medication to calm her down, she would still talk in her sleep. So imagine how hyper that, that brain of hers was and is still. So, Except now it's channelized to do other things. But at that time, because she's a child and see for us, what, would, what should happen is you have what is known as self-control that comes in by the time the child is about four or five years and social conditioning because the family, the tribe, the social conditioning will help the child to stop crying when it, when it knows how to when, to, when the child herself will know when to stop crying. Or the child will know when to use crying to satisfy its own needs, when to, how to tap which parent to get what the child wants. It will come by, it will settle by about four and a half. Now for my child, that didn't happen. That internal control didn't happen. So when she would cry, she wouldn't know when to stop crying. I mean, there have been episodes when she'd say, Amma, I would say, stop crying. Why are you crying? She, she would say, I don't know how. I don't know how to stop. So these were very confusing and very concerning episodes for me because I was like, something is wrong. This is not on. And at that time, I, had, I have cousins in the US and a couple of them, one of them is a doctor. 
So she had come to visit me and we are very close as a family. So I, was, I just asked her, you know, see, isn't something wrong? This child is, doesn't eat properly. And for that, so the amount, the quantity of food she's eating, she should be constantly hungry. But, and she shouldn't be, have so much energy. And this girl, this child has so much energy. She's not sleeping enough. And she's all over the place. And she's skinny. She was a very, very skinny child. And uh, what is it? So she was saying, yes, I think you need to, there is something wrong. You need to have her assets. So I took her to the, my pediatrician. And again, in those days, uh, they didn't see there is no research has not advanced as much as it did now. So my pediatrician, actually, I took her because she was having these high fevers. I, when I took, asked him when she was about two and a half, two and a half, I think she was. I don't remember exactly, but she was very small. And then he said, look, see, this is again, please look, all this is 14 years ago. So don't use this as criteria. Things have advanced now and there is an high risk families, families that are prone to this. Children can be assessed for high riskness by the time they are three and a half. So there is early intervention where you can do exercises to help the child. So mine is only an awareness. So you can actually uh, put your antennas you know, active and you can catch it by the time even they are three and a half when you know <coughs> because usually <coughs> specific learning difficulties run in families. 90% of the time they're genetic. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so look at my story in that perspective. And, and if it's help, if, and I'm sure when it, if it will help you. Anyway, so I asked my pediatrician when she was about two to two and a half, what's going on? And he said, look, I suspect there is some just a moment. I'm sorry, I left my water bottle here. <coughs> so my pediatrician said, look, this looks like hyperactivity. Just keep quiet and observe. Let's not put any label on the child. You wait until the school tells you. That is not the role anymore. That, is, that won't be, a, that same pediatrician now will not advise that. My pediatrician will not say that anymore. But 14 years ago, that was what it was. Okay. So he said, just wait, wait. Then I told him, I put her in the, uh, I told him uh, that this child is doing all sorts of, uh, she's not sleeping and all. She said, wait. When you put her in school, wait for the school to tell you. Until then, just observe. Because another thing which was happening for her was because she was exposed to three languages at the same time, she was stammering over certain words, not all, but some words, she was just stammering. So I was worried whether she would get a stammer. And then I went to him at the same time. So then he said, look, you, you cannot do assess or look at a child for stammer or anything until the child is four at least. So wait for the for her to evolve her own language, the vocal cords to strengthen. So she asked me to wait until four. And anyway, by four and a half, the school, uh, and then by which time I, it was coincidentally, I had my cousin had come over. And another thing, and, and I asked her and she was telling me, you know, you need to do an assessment. Something is, is, uh, is wrong. So you have to. She was the first person who said you might have to get an assessment for, at that time she called it uh, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And perhaps because of that, she's not able to read and write is what she said. So she said, start looking up for professionals who can do. Now I didn't know what ADHD was at that time. At the same time, the school called me because what was happening when she was doing the standing line, sleeping line, she was take the pencil. So you have a four rule notebook, two rule, blue color lines in the middle and then red and red at the top and bottom, right? So she'll hold the pencil and either the pressure would be very, very, uh, uh, you know, very deep lines she would draw. So the line would, the, it would be embossed into the next three pages. Right. So either it will be that or it will be very light. 
There is no in between. There is no correct pressure. And then when she's doing that, also she'll hold the pencil, and when she's focused so much on, you know, the so I would put two dots, one dot at the top, one dot at the dot bottom, so join that line. And when she's joining that line, her mouth will open because she's so focused, and she'll put the tongue little, little bit out between her teeth, like that. And she's completely focused. She'll forget to close her mouth, and she'll start drooling. Now I would tell her, close your mouth because see, it's drooling, it's not on. She just wouldn't focus. She just wouldn't get it, right? But at the same time, the contradiction is she was a very neat eater. She could eat by the time with a spoon, by the time she was sick. I made her eat by herself. She would eat with her hand, with her spoon, by the time she was about two and a half. And it was done very well. Even now, she's an extremely, she very, she's OCD. She's very well put together. She's extremely neat. And her area, her environment, even if you look at her bag, very, very ordered it is. So while eating also, <coughs> initially, as any child would make a mess, she would. But by nature, she was, uh, initially, she wouldn't be able to use her fingers like that. This was all before OT, okay? So she would eat grain by grain, and then she started using her fingers and eating. So that eating was not a problem at all. She was a non-messy eater. She would have a bath by herself by the time she was about three and a half, four years. But except she would sit there for hours together because she loves water. It's even now, she sits in the bathroom. She plays the music on. She has Alexa now to give her uh, music with special effects. And she will, she will just spend an enormous amount of time in the bathroom. And she's 19, she still does it. Anyway, so water was a lovely medium for her where she enjoys herself. So then what happened in school? Because uh, it was, and I'm still, I, I still haven't quit work. I'm continuing to work. And uh, then the school one day calls me and says, look, your daughter does activities that she likes to do on time and very well. But any activity that she doesn't like to do, she goes into the playground and she swings. And now, when I say she swings, this child swings fearlessly. As in, it, she will swing as high as the swing can take her. And a further kick will actually make the swing go 360 degrees. It is that scary. Again, we didn't realize that is, I believe, a need for the body for this motion, you know? And as the body gets that need, eventually the body will balance. Because if I were to swing like that, my head will spin. I'll throw up. I can swing for some time, but not for an hour continuously at that speed. So these are all signs which we didn't know. And she was fearless. So when she goes down on the slide, so all children will climb, you know, the ladder, put their bum on the slide and then slide down, right? My daughter will go from this walk on the slide up on the slide, not use the ladder. Then she will lie down upside down. So the head, so on her back, she will lie down on the swing and oh, sorry, on the slide and slide down. And the school caught this. I didn't know because I don't know what happens in school. Because where suddenly they wouldn't find uh, my daughter. And they would say, where is this child? And it is a small group. Imagine this is a Montessori school, five, five kids in a group, right? Even there, this child would just slip out. And, and Montessori allows you to move out. So they thought they would think she will come back. No. Then a teacher was observing why she's going away, right? why this uh, child is going away to, the, uh, to play. What is she doing? And observation, she realized this child is swinging like, like, you know, crazy. And she was going upside down on her, sliding upside down on the back, on her back on the side, because it's very easy to injure your head. But she just had a technique. She would just lift her head, go down. And then she was jumping between. So there were two seesaws. So from this seesaw to the other seesaw, there was a gap maybe of a, a, a foot and a half. 
and she would just jump from this. So there is a rod in between, right, for the seesaw, from this rod to that rod. And um, they called me and they said, look, and she's falling. And that fall never stopped. She kept falling a lot. So and she's not able to write. And she's speaking. See, speaking as well. She would speak English, understanding all that happened. So the school said, look, you guys need to do something because there is a problem. And fortunately for me, the school principal, uh, the correspondent, the, the, the lady who started the school, her nephews had a similar problem. So she said, you go and find somebody if she has to be assessed. So they gave us a choice. Go find somebody, have her assessed. So at that time, I was working in a company that was, uh, that was into training. It was an HR company. They did a lot of training. Uh, so I asked a colleague of mine, would you know anybody who do this sort of assessment? She said, I know a friend who's a speech therapist, but she does all this. So I took her there and they did an assessment. And they said, look, she has what is known as, uh, it is not full-blown ADHD, but there are elements of hyperactivity in her and she needs occupational therapy and she needs special education. That's the first time I have heard these words. So at that time, I was, I, I think I was still working. So I would take her. So only Sunday was a holiday. So three times a week was special ed, three times a week was occupational therapy in the same place. And my daughter liked special ed because the teacher was, she was a lovely lady, very gentle. Her name, her name was Diana, very gentle, wonderful soul. And my daughter just took to her. She didn't like occupational therapy at all. So we had to, I had to convince her, do all sorts of things, beg her, plead, sometimes scold, but take her because at that time she's five. What does a five-year-old know, right? So I took her. And there was progress, yes. But about after eight months of so, they said, look, this is all we can do. Beyond this, we don't have the ability and the capacity or we are not able to break through. I mean, I, I give it to them for their honesty. They were being very honest and open with me. We are not able to break beyond this. You have to do something. So at the same time, the school said, look, progress has plateaued so we can we suggest somebody for you so they suggested this place called Deeksha uh, in Vijay Raghava Road and I went to her for a pull-out program for two years now by which time I quit work because I also had a one-year-old daughter by then and I was trying to do freelance work so I'm managing a little bit of freelance work then freelance work also became sporadic because it was too much for me so I put her in Diksha for a pull-out program. So that is, she will go to school, to the Sharnalaya Montessori school in the morning for two hours, for an hour. From school, she will be pulled out. And Diksha is in that Vijayaragava road where uh, MDA's Ananya used to be there. So it is in the end of that street. Ananya is in the beginning. This one is in the end of the street. So I would take her to Diksha. So from 11 to 1, she would be in special education. And 1 o'clock, I will give her lunch. So I was driving around. So I would give her lunch, pack lunch for her in the car. I would, she would quickly eat in the car. And the problem is quickly eating is for me. Now this child is just, everything else is hyper with her, except for the eating. And I'm telling you, she will drive a saint mad with how slowly she eats. So it used to be a, because my husband is a very, he, he doesn't dither over a meal. He just eats quickly. As it is, I'm a bit slow when compared to him. But this child, so if you have to go out in a social setting, everybody will get up in the wedding and go away. This one will still be eating. Okay. So she's much better now after so many years of OT. But in the beginning, it was, it was very bad. Now she has to eat that food by the time because from Diksha, she has to go back to Sharnalaya again for until three o'clock. So from one to three, uh, 
one thirty school would begin again. So from one thirty to three, she has to go back, go back to school. So this was the routine. Thankfully, Saturday Sundays were off, but in the we had OT to contend with. So occupational therapy. Then three months into into special education in Deeksha. So the special educator, the fine lady, very nice. Sudha Challa is a wonderful person. Uh, a very uh, one of those old school special educators who looks at the child holistically. So she said, "Look, your daughter needs occupational therapy." she cannot uh, we it, it cannot work otherwise and she put me on to a like i said i was at the right place at the right time to a very senior uh, occupational therapist who used to do home programs and she was a one hell of a committed lady she's no more she passed away but uh, her name was nirmala venkateshwaran and she retired as the head of the department of occupational therapy at srm and uh, very 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 committed lady so we would go to her then she will give me first time she said i have to meet you along with your husband i will not break this rule so both of us went and then she explained to us the commitment that would require from us and what she would commit and she is a very committed lady okay so what she would commit the commitment that was required of us how long this will take and what we must do so she said come with a notebook so she didn't expect both of us to be there always she said that's not possible for the first time i want both of you to be there so first time we went and she explained everything and then she started giving her exercises where i had to make notes and make sure i do this every day and what she would do the first one month she will call me up every day imagine she is calling me up every day and she will tell me so what was the what did she do today from the explanation of what her actions her activities were she will tell me whether she did ot or not and if we didn't do ot she, she would just rip into me there were no no molly coddling she just tear me into pieces she has she is the sort who would say then if you are not committed to this why did you have the child she's she's like on the face huh short ex she would just hit you whip you with her tongue so uh and very committed i mean which ot occupational therapist calls you and finds out how the child is for her the child was important then she, she then she said once in 3 months so she saw the progress we were doing she saw the commitment that both the child and i were so she said this is what she told look the child doesn't know now but as the child understands what occupational therapy is doing to her the commitment will come from her until then you have to do it okay so by the time the child was 8 she realized 8 or 9 so my daughter realized that if she did these things it helped her do other activities not necess and not necessary school but other activities and see the school activities she wanted to do because she loved the montessori environment and she saw her peers doing it so she was motivated to do it so one thing with her is she is very see one thing with if the right kind of support is given all children with specific learning difficulties are extremely driven the commitment and the drive they have is amazing the same child who can't sit still can actually bake for 3 hours straight right so the the focus will come provided they it is in an area that they like anyway i i'm i'm going ahead so with nirmala venkateshwaran every 3 months we would have a review then depending on how where she has reached how well she is doing that activity she'll make that exercise more difficult so we went we went on and on and then she said rudula i so we i i went to her for close to uh maybe 5 years 5 6 years i was with her and then she said look i am getting old you have to find someone else and uh, now i didn't want to leave her such a such a wonderful thing she said look she'll become dependent on me now you should you should go 
So by which time what had happened? <coughs> Here, Diksha said two years done. So this is all we can do for this child. You must now take her out and see who can help her. Perhaps MDA can help her. So by then what happened? She came to class five. And the Montessori setup, the school had only till class five. And after that, we had to move her out of it because the next school, we, we are living in uh, close to the school. Now they were going to have their middle school back of the beyond on OMR. Okay, and there's no way we are going to commute, travel because by then the second child is also growing up and I'm not going to disrupt everything. So I moved her to MDA, Madras Dyslexia Association, Ananya. So she was there from six, seven, for another, from six to the first exam she took. And by the way, she hadn't taken a single exam by then. So occupational therapy now is continuing, still continuing. See, we continued occupational therapy until she was 13 years. When uh, Nirmala Pandit said, you can stop now, enough, you've done enough. Mr. Nirmala Pandit said by then. So, so from she, when she was five years to 13, it, it got done. And here I must say, not only were we driven, but the child cooperated. See, if the child doesn't cooperate, you can't do anything. And I think that cooperation comes when you take the child into, you know, explain this to the child. And then you have an entire extended family that is supporting this explanation. Then, then it will happen. So here, okay, those I will answer in the question answer session. So here, I, I, let me continue with my story. So we, we moved to Madras Dyslexia Association. So occupational therapy is continuing. Special education is now continuing in MDA Ananya itself. Now at that time, what happened? She's now come to class six, has not taken a single test, cannot write, cannot read on her own. She's 11 years old and doing her own thing still. So I am in the, so to support that, what was I doing at home was, I would tell them in, before they go to bed every night, this was a policy at bedtime, they would get one story in English and one story in Telugu. Telugu is my mother tongue. So I'll tell, I'll read to them a story in English and then I will tell. So storytelling was in the mother tongue for me in Telugu while reading was in English. So they got both, both my children. So uh, my older daughter also got it. I would, I would tell bedtime stories that way. Because this child was anyway, at least sleeping time now has advanced. So instead of sleeping at two o'clock, my daughter was now sleeping at 11 o'clock, right? It is better than, uh, see at that time, again, there was no uh, scientific research or any research on controlling food and sugar and stuff. So by the time uh, Mrs. Nir uh, Ms. Nirmala Venkateshwaran figured that out, my daughter had crossed that stage. So she was telling me now I advocate it, but she has passed that stage. So it doesn't matter to her anymore because she has a sweet tooth, my daughter. And uh, uh, so what happened was, so at home, this was happening. There was always storytelling and I would drag them off to any program, any, anything that for children theater was happening. I will take these two children and take them to theater. Any music program was fighting, these would go. Any exhibitions, so the other exposure, and I would, at that time, you could get into IIT, right? So I had a cousin studying there, so I would take them on nature trails in IIT. So I would, we would walk through IIT, look at the plants, look at the trees, you know, do that sort of thing. So, and go to that same, uh, what is that, Adyar, Adyar, uh, there is this Adyar Creek, no, park. I forget what it is called. So I would take them there. The weekends were spent doing that. So pack food in small dabbas. So we became pro at eating food in an auto and, and going off to whatever uh, was going on in the cultural scenario. And of course, meeting family, we would spend time with her, her grand, other set of grandparents, right? Her in my in-laws. So, and with, and husband would be home over the weekend. So that was a, 
that was a very uh, that was what we did together uh, and that was done every weekend every weekend was stuff was done together so this is the home front that was happening so she went to uh, ananya which was run by the which is still run by the madras dyslexia association and at that time there was this new program see th this program had come about uh, i heard about it when when my daughter was say in uh, class 4 it was called the multiple intelligences program and i chased them i chased them i mean everywhere i was known for chasing people i would just call up and be after them and uh, that program for whatever reasons <coughs> had been taken off so i kept badgering and badgering and one fine day i think they saw my when they heard my voice uh they were like yes we are, we are having that program now in any case by which time luckily fortunately she also moved into ananya now what this multiple intelligence inches program does it was it is now integrated into their curriculum but at that time they had just started it so they'll expose the child to many 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 uh many many uh, avenues intelligences because we think intelligence is only science and maths but there is music there is uh there is nature you know right the multiple in, i will let you la read about it on your own so they expose the the child to many many of these um uh, arts and crafts and um uh, intelligences so that they will pick whatever suits them and by then i had realized that i have been such a hands on mother that i have been doing every doing in sense i wouldn't do it for them see that's one thing all of us were clear is we won't do anything for her but we will make her do so that's why she is very structured she puts things so when she was very small she would have her own bag where she'll put her things it takes a lot of effort but it is very beneficial because especially with adhd you need they need sld essentially needs structure so the structure was you come back from school take off your shoes put the shoes in the rack take the socks put the socks for wash take your lunch uh, put the school bag in, in this place only take the lunch box go to the kitchen put it remove the dabba put it and turn on the water so it will soak so it has extended now that she is going on an internship she comes back in the evening and washes her washes her lunch box everything puts it so that it's ready for next morning so she's it's it's an it's she's become independent but this has to start when they are very small packing their clothes putting their clothes into their shell so all these we did right from they were small because that is also part of the again we didn't know it's called executive functions we knew it only later but then she would so you know when we were folding clothes her job was to fold all the napkins and her her small you know they have child's underwear her uh, frocks were very difficult but her petticoats small so her slips small small things that she would she would do so that's how we started and she had a small she loves pink and that has remained with her i think she will remain with her for life she still loves pink and i and i don't like that color very much anyway so she had a small uh you know backpack sort of thing so whenever we would travel she'll put her things in that bag and she will she will take care of it i mean she will drop everything else but that bag she will take care so the thing of taking care of your things doing your own work was done from they were very when when she was when both my children were very very small so for the younger daughter it became an extension because what the older one does uh it she will continue to do now so and it it's done it's she's learned it so well that now she makes sure that the younger her, her sibling gets the job done so that's how it is anyway so multiple intelligences program what they did uh they exposed this child to many many things so and i was i by then i realized i also was wanted my child to go away from me because she she has to do learn to learn to start doing things by herself so i would just put her in that center and i would run away from there i would tell them i am not here until you call me you call me i will pick her up and go away so until pick up time i am not going to wait outside also that was a conscious decision it was an effort for me to go back 
and come again. But I wanted to do that because I didn't want this child to look to me for everything. So uh, at this program, because see, my daughter has a very good voice. I thought she will learn to sing because my husband, my husband and his side of the family, they sing beautifully. And this child has a honey voice, which I thought she will sing, but this one doesn't want to sit and learn to sing. And she has a very good, uh, she can pick up sounds in music very well. So some, when we were listening to the radio while driving, she said, Amma, that what is, isn't that a piano? Then she said, I want to learn the keyboard. So here I bought, got invested in one small keyboard, which she didn't take to at all well. See, this is again exposing them to various avenues, right? She didn't take to a well. Remember, the thing is, my daughter has dysgraphia. Dysgraphia is problem with handwriting, right? And now when you have problem with handwriting, where will you pay the keys in the keyboard? And she has facial issues. So crossing the road is a problem with her. So how will you imagine the music and then play it? So she didn't like it at all. Six months, she let go. But fortunately for me, the younger one took over and, and she took to it very well and she's continuing to learn. So I had to invest in a bigger one. But anyway, that was fortunate for me. So we exposed her to, uh, exposed her to music. Keyboard didn't work. She took to swimming very well. And we have to go back to it again after the pools open. But she, and I put her into uh, against, actually, this was against what my husband was saying because tennis. Uh, fortunately, tennis, the coaches were very, very kind and understanding. And, I, and it did help her, help her hand-eye coordination. It took her eight months to actually bounce the ball, you know, and then bounce it again on the racket. And it took her another totally close to a year to act, to play. You know, they will lob the ball, one bounce and hit it. But in the over, without any pressure, but she would skip. So everyday training, she went all five days a week. But that skipping and lobbing the ball did help her in her other things when, when uh, swimming was not happening. But swimming is something she loves and we hope to go back to it again. So all these things, exposure to things was going on side by side. And here I was racking my brain, what else to do for her? At Hydra, after doing, they were also ex uh, showing her many, many uh, crafts and activities. They figured that she loves to bake. She was ex not only bake, but cook. Now that was new for me. I, I never expected that. Then she took to it and because, so when she was in, I think she was about 12 at that time, as part of Hydra, what they had to do, they have, uh, each of them have to do uh, an activity for a month or I think two months, if I'm sure, if I'm not mistaken. So they will uh, play the drums or play the piano, all exposed and they'll have an expert who will come and show them how to do it. So they will, and there'll be somebody who will come and do embroidery. There'll be someone who will come and teach them uh, theater. So they are exposed to so many crafts, uh, uh, so many um, intelligences. And generally, the kids tend to pick up one that they like. Many of the time, for the sheer lack of exposure, my daughter took to cooking and baking. And we were surprised. So, and here, see, she has a problem. So, dys, dysgraphia, is, see, mixing is a problem, kneading is a problem, all this. But with OT and all the other things we were doing at home, so at the end of the year in Hydra, that is, uh, the children have to put up a, uh, they do an activity and they, uh, and they put up a stall to showcase everything that they have. So, whatever they have made, they will put up a stall and they sell. So all parents come and encourage them by buying this. So you have these embroidered handkerchiefs. <coughs> there are children who do paintings. There are murals. There is a boy who did graffiti, graffiti on canvas. And that painting was sold for some, you know, some thousands of rupees, which was, which is a very, uh, which encourages these children a lot. 
so my daughter with along with other three children so these are all 11 12 year olds they put up a food stall i thought you know uh, i mean i i wasn't aware i mean they won't tell anything so it's a surprise for the parents they send out an invitation the only thing i got was my job was to boil uh 2 kilos of potatoes and deliver it to the school that was my contribution only then i realized when they said 2 kilos potatoes oh my god what are they doing so these three children mashed those 2 kilos of potatoes they made cutlets for 60 people believe 60 60 adults so the stall had cutlets and they made a, a fruit salad that was my daughter's contribution she said everybody makes vegetable salad and she that that's one of her favorite salads at home she still makes it and she uh, the highlight was she uh, uh, seasoned it with uh, mint <coughs> so anyway do let's i'm not going to get into this i don't like cooking in any case <coughs> so the she made they made the salad and they made a a kheer up a sweet and they sold it and here this child's job was now she is a very very shy reticent child who refuses to speak to people she will not you can ask anybody any of the older pa- parents who have been in this group longer who have known sa who have known my daughter they will tell you she will never open her mouth her teachers will tell you she will never open her mouth but this child's job was to take up paper and pencil and take orders for their stall right so what this program did this hydra multiple intelligences program did it tapped their ability their advantage and made them confront their fear now my daughter's insecurity and fear is writing and talking to people but in a very in a in a they created an atmosphere where she had to face that so she went took orders which i fell off the chair because this one they saying how many what do you want then i said one plate cutlet so she would write one so they had codes there c for cutlet so that she didn't have to write everything so c and she'll put a dash one and she'll tear off that slip and give it to the kitchen and then she would service the order so this gave her the confidence to start reading so her teachers would say okay now next you want to make this so she would choose a recipe then they said this is for four people or six people you have to bring it down to two people figure it out for yourself so initially she would use technology she would uh, look at the she would uh, look at youtube videos because she can't write writing was a problem not she can't it's very slow she, and her spellings are still wonky right she has a very very good she has a near photographic memory so the brain naturally compensates for what you don't have right so she remembers she sees the procedure she will never forget it and she has a very good tongue very sensitive tongue so when she puts stuff on her tongue she knows nearly what went into it so because of uh, her, her the love or liking for baking and cooking she started reading she started pulling out books from her school library for recipes and then she started making so she started to actually when i i would not she is not reading grade level it is only uh, you know she is still putting words together syllables together at 13 13 years 13 years so i was very husband and i were very happy so we were like oh god she is reading so by then what happened she has not written a single exam in her life we have exposed her to all these different areas she has reached a certain level with occupational therapy she's come somewhere now we had to take a decision on whether to uh you know whether to continue ot or not so by which time we had changed uh, there was a ot person that she was going to from at uh, mda itself and then we had to go to someone else so this this is the last person we went to and uh, she didn't like it she says amma i don't like ot i don't like that place what to do because till then what happened she had only exclusive ot one on one ot right she didn't meet other people but where the last place that we had to go to 
it was very crowded. It was addressing children with multiple disabilities. So you got children with different kinds of disabilities coming there. So, and Sahiti was very sincere, no problem. She didn't have any uh, issues or she wouldn't get scared or cry or anything, but she had problem with noise. She doesn't like loud noises. See, this is another auditory thing she had because when she was smaller, she say, for example, if you, if when she was in Montessori, she would say pot, pa, otter. And when you say, what's the first syllable, first sound, she would say t, which is actually the last sound. But she would say t because that's the first sound she heard. So see, all these are indicators for her. She, had, she has auditory issues and she has trouble crossing the road because she doesn't know how to gauge from where the, uh, how to manage the distance. So if the car is coming from that side, Will I be able to cross the road in that time? She is doing that only now in our street. It's we haven't still done it in the main road, and she's 98, right? So, but she could cycle from Shimon. She was very small, tricycle and then bicycle. She's she started. So this problem with in crossing the road can also be felt in math. She still has trouble with math. That is an area we are still addressing. So when she's doing subtraction, counting backwards. So what comes before and what comes after? Before and after is still an issue. So like I, I want to tell everybody, 80% you help. 20, they will figure it out for themselves. And the rest of the 20% are quirk of personality. You cannot just take out, remediate everything. It's not possible. And at this point in time, she has owned her dyslexia because if you remove dyslexia from her, she's nothing. And dyslexia has made her what she is. And we made sure that she is comfortable in it, right? So, uh, so she has all these spatial issues still. And uh, uh, so we have now, she's now come to class nine and uh, my husband and I have, have decided, okay, if she's not going to finish her education, doesn't matter. We will get her to do a craft. Let her get equipped with some skill so that she'll be financially independent. Because my husband was like, I don't care if she doesn't study. He's still like that. It doesn't matter to me if there is no education, as in if there is no degree, so to speak. But she, she needs life skills. She needs survival skills. She should be able to read to help her in her life. Degrees, in fact, I was the one who would wonder, okay, what will she do if she doesn't pass 12? As when was, doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And he, he stands by that even now. So for me, I've reached the stage where it doesn't matter. If what she, I will do, I will follow her. She can do what she wants, right? So, but then Mrs. Nirmala Pandit in uh, MDA said, look, all that is fine. But you must give, you cannot decide for her. She should decide for herself. She has that intelligence. You wait. Minimum 12th, she must do. Because it will open up opportunities for her. For her, if she wants to become an entrepreneur, she wants to take any home loans or something like that, a 12th pass is a very good uh, certificate for you to get financial security, financial uh, help. So we were like, okay, now what to do? And she was in class nine and one day she turns around and says, look, I want to take the class 10 exam. So we were like, okay, you want to take class 10 exam? Yes, I want to write. So that's when at MDA, we registered her for NIOS exam. We said, look, let, let her take one exam because she's never taken an exam. She has no clue or concept of what an exam is. And then she took it. We had to apply for a scribe. She can't write. So we practiced with the scribe and the first exam, I think English, she got some 70%, I think. And from then, there was no looking back. She has been attempting exams, doing her thing. Uh, and pandemic has actually, uh, I shouldn't be saying that has helped her. Because she took to online classes very well. Many people don't, they are very, they're not at all successful, but with her, they were successful 
and then my husband and i decided and here i put my foot down even more than him because once in a way he says you think she has to go back to school you think she is good you know but we decided we will not send her to school for class 12 put her on an internship she can uh, take her exams so she'll be taking two of them in april as she does her internship in in baking she can finish her 12th so she has a practical skill and one of the good things that happened with the internship was she has become uh far more independent and she has learned to stand up because the first so she's on a second internship now so in each place she goes for 6 months so she went to this place called the table which makes jar pastries run by a very wonderful and understanding a gem of a chef very nice guy so she initially it was she's the youngest there and for herself it was a culture shock and she was very quiet and then she would come home and she says amma they're teasing me and they're doing they're, they're telling me stuff why are they so rude to me and she doesn't she took her a while to realize that office banter there is something called teasing in when you're working as a team you laugh there is sarcasm because she still doesn't get sarcasm it it's i don't think children with um uh, sld get sarcasm because not many i think it is a generalized rule mine doesn't get and i don't think she will get which is actually good for her so she has learned to stand up for herself say ama na apdi da enna va unakku you know what is it to you i am like that only so what i talk a lot so what so the same child who who wouldn't talk at all now talks non stop so much so that we are like just give us a break please don't talk so much so she is making up for all those years where she wouldn't open her mouth and now she's on her second internship and internship has taught her to be uh, take care of herself i don't do anything for her she gets ready on she's nearly making it on time now nearly on time right so she has to be there at 10 it's close now to our house and she has to leave home by 9:45 she's ready by 9:30 so you know she's able to now she's able to read time not on a digital clock but on a regular clock and she's able to take care of herself because she still has a long way to go but now that is her journey i am only an enabler in terms of helping her find spaces to work but how she works what she does how she is able to navigate those spaces are all her own and uh, and simultaneously now she started working studying for her exams and this previously i until even last year i would be cooking she would sit in the kitchen and read her lesson and then answer questions but from this year onwards she sets her own time and she is reading grade level 12th standard textbook by herself and she's figured out she uses technology i have not stopped i swear by technology i think the earlier we start technology for children for our children the better it is because they are able to adapt very very well to tech so she is using technology now and she is also figuring out how to use the desktop for dictation so when she speaks to i think word has a lot of windows has a lot of i'm, I'm sorry microsoft word has a lot of office as many things which are advantages so she is also said instead of learning to type me as well speak to my computer and it would just uh types it out for me so i think i've really taken a lot of time so now we are in she's 19 we are at the threshold of the next part of the journey where she is doing she will enable herself we will only provide spaces for her so i think i will stop and i will open i'm open to questions